having no gift of strategy or arms, no secret weapon and no wall defense. I shall become a citizen of love. That little nation with the blood-stained sun, where even the slain have power. The only country that sends forth an ambassador to God. Brethren Voices celebrates 13 years of monthly programs sharing what brethren do as a matter of faith. You have just heard the amazing music of Steve Kinsey to wonderful scenes we've never shown before of a new community project learning tour to Arctic Village, Alaska, 100 miles north of the Arctic Circle. The mountains shown are in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Hello, I'm Brent Carlson. Welcome to Brethren Voices. The learning tours provide a way to support the native Gwich'in people of Arctic Village, whose lives are threatened by oil drilling in the refuge. And it's a threat to the porcupine caribou herd as well, which the native Gwich'in people are so dependent upon for their livelihood. Brethren Voices has just completed 13 years and we begin year 14 with this program. We will take a look at some of the more memorable programs during the last 13 years. We have actually featured Brethren in 18 different states and seven countries during the past 13 years. One of our first programs came from Loosedale, Mississippi. Programs initially were taped in the sanctuary of Portland's Peace Church of the Brethren, and Rachel Waz Scholl was the host of the program. Cue cards were used in front of Rachel to help her with the script of the programs. And we used a nice fern as a backdrop. The program of April 2007 featured Brethren Disaster Ministries as seven members of Peace Church traveled to Mississippi to assist with rebuilding following Hurricane Katrina. Hello, I'm Rachel Waz Shaw, and welcome to Brethren Community Television. It seems that disasters make up much of our news these days. From the hurricane ravaged south and the tornadoes that strike the country from south to the northern states, and that doesn't even include the disaster of our own inhumanity to one another, war. When disasters strike, the Church of the Brethren Disaster Response provides volunteers to clean up debris and repair and rebuild homes for disaster survivors. The Book of Galatians suggests that we should carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. The Church of the Brethren has historically been involved in providing relief for the suffering, whether caused by war or natural disaster. The Disaster Response Program was originally established in 1941 as part of the Brethren Service Commission. Today, it is committed to serving the survivors of disasters with material aid, as well as disaster child care for families who are dealing with the trauma. Following Hurricane Katrina, Brethren have been assisting survivors in Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. With our program today, we will follow a group of volunteers from the Oregon-Washington District of the Church of the Brethren. They will be joined with four volunteers from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and the project directors from Fruitdale, Idaho. Right now, we have Brent Carlson, who is from the Portland Peace Church of the Brethren, and he's in Loosedale, Mississippi currently with the family having breakfast at a McDonald's restaurant. Hello, Brent. Hello, Rachel. I'm here this morning in Loosedale, Mississippi with Bo Clark. He's one of the local people and went through Katrina hurricane and has quite a story to tell. He was a little north of here when the storm broke out and uh, he, he got very busy, didn't you? Yes, sir. Very busy. We what was... Uh, I was, I was up, up north of where uh, my um, girlfriend lives at in um, Bay Springs, Mississippi, 
and we really didn't expect the storm to be as bad as it was going to be. I knew that it was going to be a pretty bad storm, but then all of a sudden it got worse over, what, 12 hours or more of a wind and down trees and all, and we all got blocked in. But they were, everywhere I seen people's houses were demolished, trees were everywhere, and people was just in chaos. They didn't know what to do, you know. So I, I knew that nobody had no electricity. When I got home, I knew my mother didn't have no electricity. My daughter, none of my, my sons, I have two sons that works for me. I own a construction company. I just shut it down. I shut down. I took off to Atlanta. First thing I done, I went to Atlanta, Georgia. And I was about an eight-hour drive. Right. And I went up there and bought all the, the generators I could find up there and began to come back and finding the elder people that didn't have electricity and was, was just, like I said, they was devil. They, they had never been through nothing like this. And so I just, uh, I just went and... Um, started giving generators, just giving them to people, and then giving them gas. I bought gas, and I really didn't think about how much gas I needed to get when I got, so I, so I realized I didn't have enough for gas. And for seven days, for seven or eight days, I run back and some forest to Atlanta, to Eastman, Georgia, to Birmingham, to Montgomery, I'm buying gas and generators, mm -hmm. and just continue supplying people. And just, I mean, I, I just was on a steady run. What's amazing to me is how organized the Church of the Brethren is in their disaster response. And even though we're a very small denomination uh, as compared with many others, the ministries that are performed uh, via the disaster reconstruction is just outstanding. Um, the people, the equipment, the housing, the food, the uh, just everything about how these projects are set up just continues to amaze me at how well it's done. But it's a blessing, and we appreciate it. We appreciate you volunteers so much. There's, I mean, there's, there's, not a, there's really no real word to say, but just thank God for y'all. Brethren Voices has featured 10 of the past annual conference moderators who shared their faith and life experiences. We've also been able to meet with many folks who grew up in other faiths and found the Church of the Brethren. Jay Whitmire, Executive Director of Global Missions for the Church of the Brethren, met with us to discuss their international ministries, including BVS, the Office of Public Witness, as well as various work camps. The Brethren have a certain space within Christendom where we see ourselves. Um, so these would be just core brethren beliefs, so a real focus on peace and what that means. A real focus on community, looking at the church as a body, less as individualistic. Um, thinking about the gifts of the spirit to be used, not for our own personal benefit, um, in terms of sanctification or blessing, but using the gifts of the spirit to serve the body of Christ. Um, and then relating with one another. Um, and so when we come into a space like Rwanda and engage Rwanda, but it was Christians in those areas that had a real hunger to see Christianity differently, to understand it differently, and to say, how is it that Christians could be killing Christians in this context? Um, there must be something else. So that opened the door for the Church of the Brethren. Somebody has to know somebody yeah. to get the phone call. So are we, are we sitting on some boards? Are we connected with interfaith groups around the world? How, how does somebody say, you know, maybe the Church of the Brethren could offer something here? Well, all of those things. I mean, certainly the Internet, certainly mass communications. But it's really an age of travel, an age of social media, people getting to know each other. Um, in, our work in Venezuela is significantly different, but it gives a little insight on how these connections take place. Brethren from the Dominican Republic had gone to Venezuela and were preaching, and their message really resonated. And a number of churches got together and said, come, you know, teach us some more. And, and the Dominican said, you know, if the American church would support us in this and send people, so we did that. Um, but the Church of the Brethren also has Venezuelan pastors in there, at least one in, in particular. So it's those connections that, you know, immigrants and um, immigration and other, uh, other ways people stay connected and move forward. So. 
We've been very fortunate over the years to feature Brethren musicians on Brethren Voices. The Mutual Kumquat has been a favorite for many. We featured Mutual Kumquat in concert at the 19th Annual Song and Story Fest held in New Meadows, Idaho. And One Step at a Time, which was written and performed by David Hupp. <laughs> August 2017, we met with Carol Mason, who compiled stories and photos of the Nigerian brethren who have suffered so much at the hands of the Boko Haram. Carol is an incredible person, but the story she tells is even more amazing. But we, the Church of the Brethren from the Nigeria Crisis, has Brethren Village camps, like they've got whole new camps in safe areas with borehole water. So if you look at the photograph, you'll see not only the borehole water, which is some foreign influence saying, we'll get some money and we'll do this, but what creatively comes out of the camp is we're off the grid. We can't run and get even a diesel generator, or get that water out of the ground, so they do solar. So you'll see solar panels. Mm. They, and of course, you know, the really, the really deserty, you know, off the grid kind of areas where no no villages are, no towns are. That's where it's safe. But the only people out there are Fulani, who are the nomadic tribes with their cattle. So they make friends with the cattle and say, a cattle keeper saying, "Here is clean water for you guys. Can we have your cow dung?" <laughs> and they do biogas for their cooking. Mm. You see, so the creativity. You take all these villagers who may have been farming in their local village, 
And what's so beautiful about the camp is that instead of saying, oh, now we each have to vie for a little piece of ground, they make cooperative farms. So your, your independent subsistence farmer is now thinking cooperatively how to feed the camp. So the camp becomes this incredible microcosm of a little kingdom of God that is so cooperative mm -hmm. and caring for all because it's just a beautiful image. I mean, you'll have... Like one woman in the Women's Fellowship explained it to me. She said, well, think about it. You know, like we have this praise song kind of like we all stand equal at the foot of the cross. It's like no matter what you were in your previous life, like we're, we're all internally displaced people, campers now that we all are on the same level and those who can help those who can't and we have to help each yeah. other. So it's just a beautiful witness. We've traveled on learning tours in many places with David Radcliffe of the New Community Project to places that are threatened in some way, but he indicates that we are all in danger, whether we realize it or not. He states that by the year 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than there are fish. David states that we need champions who will make a difference to this planet. He also indicated that he himself is often brought up to date on things that are affecting this great earth. God called this creation good back in Genesis. We just about to call it gone. Right. By the way, we humans are messing with this place that God has given us as a trust. So we have to be alert to how to be good stewards of God's creation or what's left of it. <laughs> because as it goes, we go. This is our earth and our home. Same with our neighbors. They need care too. Uh, a Harvard sociologist, I couldn't believe when I read this, but a Harvard sociologist recently said there are a lot fewer people being killed today in wars around the world than ever before. Now, does it look that way to you? <laughs> it doesn't seem that way. And I think part of the issue is there's more and more conflicts in more and more places tearing apart more and more lives. They may not, may not actually be dying, but be, more refugees right now in the world than any time since World War II. Over 50 million people without a place to call home because of some conflict in their place or environmental collapse or ethnic cleansing or you name it, they got it. So there's a lot more trouble in the world in a lot more places. Maybe not as many absolute deaths, but a lot of trouble and trauma for people just trying to find a place of security and safety and clean water and food for their families. And thank goodness for the crop walk and you guys taking part in that. They are reaching Church World Services, reaching out to those people in all of those situations all around the world. Actually, Julia is my little budding environmentalist, you might say. She lives here in Lancaster. She lives here in Lancaster. Well, to me, it's here in Lancaster. To you, it's down there in Lancaster. But she lives uh, down in Lancaster. Uh, she cleans up her neighborhood. We go on bike rides, and all she wants to do is pick up recyclables. And she's on to stuff like palm oil, which I don't know if you've heard about. But it's this ingredient in about everything from our cosmetics to our ice cream. They get it from the palm tree and they're cutting down tropical forests all around the world to harvest this palm oil. And Julie's on to stuff like that. And her mother, bless her heart, buys the 100% nothing but peanuts peanut butter. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's healthy, but you know, it don't really taste like peanut butter. Anyhow, <laughs> I'm feeling like these kids are suffering. And so I'm the grandparent. I got some rights in this situation. So I'm coming down. I'm heading down from Harrisburg to their house. And I was going to stop in by the giant and get some stuff for supper. Well, I cruise the peanut butter aisle, as I usually do in any store, just because I'm always looking for sales on peanut butter. And there it was, the planters. The planters peanut butter, marked down special, half price. So I got two of them. I'm thinking, I can wait till I get this to the grandkids. They're going to be so elated. So I take that stuff home. I proudly walk in as the grandparent bearing gifts. You should have seen their faces light up. First thing out of Julia's mouth is, Pop, Pop, does it have palm oil? <laughs> in my excitement, I hadn't thought to look. In her excitement, she hadn't forgot to ask. Uh, planters. Planters has... Um, palm oil, and so does a Jif, Jif peanut butter. It's actually not considered, Jif isn't considered peanut butter, it's considered peanut spread um, because it has like, it's natural, but it has like so much of one thing that it, it's not, it can't be considered butter anymore. Many are living in very difficult times. 
And we often ask our guests on Brethren Voices, what gives you hope? In our program on the March for Our Lives following the school shooting massacre at Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida, we interviewed children who gave us hope for the future. You guys have grown up in a world where a lot of people have guns and uh, some bad things happen. What are you hoping for in your lifetime in the way of things to change? What would you like to see? I would like to see um, gun laws passed. I'd like to see background checks happen. I'd like to see um, our president not being dumb and we should have rights. We are, we're, we're going to school to learn. We're not going to school to be shot up and killed. Do you think it's too easy sometimes for people to get guns? Yeah, they need to do background checks because someone that is like someone that might be mentally ill could go in and buy a gun and then what happened in a lot of our a lot of the gun cases uh, with schools that's happened because someone who's mentally ill has gone in to the gun store and they've bought guns and then our president is also funding the NRA so I think that's bad too. And if our president wants to stop the gun the gun things from happening, the shootings from happening, then he should not be funding the NRA. He should be stopping the NRA and getting higher uh, gun laws passed. And we also don't need teachers to have guns. That's just stupid. It's dumb. Nancy Fitzgerald was the pastor of the Arlington Church of the Brethren when we met with her. And we were very impressed with her enthusiasm and the outreach of their congregation. She loves technology and the opportunities that technology presents. But I love technology and to me it's just like the air we breathe and I know that's true for folks in high school. You know, you just assume that Wi-Fi and cellular connections are there and you use them all the time. You put kids in front of a computer, they don't even know what it is and pretty soon they're using it. Sure they are, but I remember the first time I said Google it in a sermon. I said, Google it and check me out, and a couple of people laughed. Uh, but pretty soon we were talking about tweeting things, and the congregation isn't all on Twitter, but they all know what Twitter is, and they've owned the ministry that we have on Twitter. Do you find this challenging for the, the quote, uh, older brethren? It, to me, it's no more challenging than the telephone. I'm sure it was challenging when it first came Probably out. That, that Do you use the telephone or do you keep walking next door? Do you use your car or do you keep using your horse because you have one? I mean, God has given uh, humankind the brain to develop so many things. Why wouldn't we want to communicate even better and faster and cleverer? Many years ago, Chuck Boyer was an annual conference moderator. And he was very influential to many people. His words continue to speak wisdom even today. We were fortunate to be able to meet with him prior to his death in 2010. How did you come to your beliefs and convictions about this? Well, it certainly, it certainly was a pilgrimage because I, I grew up in an era when anybody who was homosexual uh, kept that quiet. It just it was not something that uh, you talked about. And um, I preached a sermon during the year I was moderator. I preached a sermon here in the Laverne Church uh, and traced a little bit of, of my pilgrimage from a time of, uh, you know, where I really was, well, I was rather mean-spirited toward homosexual people. I just didn't know anybody who was homosexual. I and I, I confessed that and ended up the sermon by pleading with, with more love and acceptance for, uh, for our uh, brothers and sisters who, who are gay, lesbian, or bisexual. But I think, I think my pilgrimage really got underway when uh, I first knew people who were homosexual. And I didn't know one of them who really wanted to be. You know, why would a person choose in the 50s when I first began to learn to know homosexual people? Why would anyone choose to be homosexual? Uh, I mean, it was, it, it, that, that was what I think opened me to, to reconsider my views, probably. Chuck, were there any positives that came out of that experience? 
Now the positive that came out of it was for, for people who had felt on the edge and had felt very little support from uh, leaders in the church. Many of them were very thankful, you know, that there was a voice at least questioning whether the the uh, homophobia in the church could be dealt with more openly. And, and uh, I received, you know, a lot of real gratitude and appreciation from from folks who either had loved ones uh, who were gay, lesbian, or bisexual, or who themselves were, uh, you know, homosexual people. Life as a follower of Jesus is not meant to be easy. And Jesus warned us about that. Peace churches are among the smallest congregations in our country, as peace is still quite controversial. We are a nation of over 300 million guns. Many of them are military style. As I speak, we are having problems with immigration and sharing our country with others, even to the point of separating children from their parents. Our earth is in danger from overheating and pollution. But one thing is clear. We each have the opportunity to personally make the changes necessary to live as Christ lived and to live at peace with our neighbors. This is Brent Carlson for Brethren Voices. Peace be with you. Uh, many of us have um, purchased vehicles. In fact, on a sunny morning, if you're here and look at the number of Toyota Prius models in the parking lots and other types of hybrids and electric cars, we've tried to live that out. Um, we are aware of the number of appliances that we use. We are, we are thoughtful about the lights that we purchase and how we keep them on. We're very cognizant. Again, walking lightly on the earth uh, part of that becomes a ministry that's not that designated program, but rather a lifestyle that helps us live out that faith a little bit more clearly than if we simply said we're doing this as a project or this is a community ministry. We feel like we need to model it. We need to exemplify it. Oh. Uh -huh.